Hi everybody, I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Congressman Greg Murphy. Congressman, thank you so much for joining me. Nice to see you, Brittany. Thank you. I do want to set the scene where we're at right now. So round one to nominate Jim Jordan for House Speaker has failed. Right now, defectors voted for Congressman Scalise McCarthy, even former Congressman Lee Zeldin. Simply put, now what? Yeah, so Brittany, you know, um, I'll just say from the beginning, I was against the whole thing. I, I think Speaker McCarthy was doing a good job leading the conference. It's it's kind of disappointing that 4% of the people were able to throw him out. But um, we're just going to see, you know, Jordan didn't have the votes. Um, and he's going to have to see if he can convince those individuals who did not vote for him the first time, maybe because of a protest vote, maybe because they didn't feel McCarthy should have been ousted. And maybe they, they felt uh, Scalise shouldn't have been ousted. And so hopefully those protest votes, uh, if Jim wants to be the, uh, the speaker, he'll be able to convince those people to, you know, basically on the second round, put the short votes down before. It's going to be a little bit harder for those that actually are against Jim Jordan, not just as a, uh, a, uh, a protest vote. So we'll have to see. It's going to be an afternoon of him having discussions, and we'll see what happens, uh, happens moving forward. Can you give us some insight into how those discussions are going? As we know, round one, you did vote for Jim Jordan, but I've seen some reporting, and obviously this can change as everything's fluid, that it's only looking worse for Jim Jordan. Is that how you're feeling? No, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. But I'll say, Brittany, from day one, I've said this very well may be a compromised candidate, an individual that, you know, Scalise, there were some folks that did not like him from some of the stuff in the past. Uh, same thing with Jordan. And it may be an individual, I'll submit, maybe Kevin Hearn from Oklahoma or Mike Johnson from Louisiana, who doesn't have, uh, I don't want to say the baggage, but doesn't have some of the things that people dislike about them, someone who can be a consensus candidate. Uh, Mike was a previous leader of the RSC, the Republican Study Committee. Uh, Kevin is the present leader of the Republican Study Committee. So I think either of those individuals probably wouldn't have as many people having issues with them moving forward. And so they may end up being a compromised candidate. Do you think, what's the likelihood of that happening right now? Because we know that you were going to vote to, to, um, for Jordan. So is this consensus candidate going to emerge anytime soon? Well, I, I can't say that for sure. You know, um, Paul Boehner, um, when he was removed and then uh, Paul Ryan, so I'm, I'm sorry, Paul Ryan came out as a consensus candidate uh, when Boehner was taken down. And so uh, it may be a spur of the moment kind of thing. And people just said, I've I'm, I'm had enough is enough. I'm ready to move forward. I want to talk about some of your comments from last week. You reportedly said this about uh, Jim Jordan. He should get, quote, 24 hours or the weekend or whatever to see if they can get the votes. And if they can't get the votes, roll on. How many rounds are you going to stand with Congressman Jordan here? Or, you know, have you seen enough after one round and it's time to, as you said, roll on? Well, I think that, you know, this was the first vote. It was the first weekend of... Uh, he and I, I think McCarthy was also trying to make uh, make inroads against people who were against Jordan. We'll see what the next you know little while goes for. Uh, Brittany, you don't know me, but I'm a surgeon, and it's kind of like if something's not working, then you try a different direction. I think it's fine to give somebody the time. This was the first vote, first official vote for him to see if he can gather things up. But if he can't, you know. Um, Mr. McCarthy stepped down, wouldn't go for another vote again when he was taken out. Same thing with Scalise. And I would expect if uh, Jordan sees the handwriting in the wall that he would do the same. I do want to talk about some comments I heard yesterday from your colleague, uh, Congressman Brad Sherman. He's a Democrat from California. And he told me that he could see, uh, he floated the name former President George W. Bush as a potential speaker of the house or he said another reasonable republican is someone who democrats he could see getting behind would you support someone who isn't in the house right now for speaker or even former president george w bush well not at this point in time Brittany. i don't think we're there yet um i think we need to see where uh jim goes just in deference to the fact he won a majority of the republican vote uh, before we go jumping off on some of these other uh, other candidates Okay, let's keep the spotlight on Congressman Jim Jordan. Are you voting for him in round two, and why, if so? Well, I don't see any. I voted for him in round one. I don't see that there, there's not another candidate um, at this point in time. And if we go to a round two, um, absolutely, I'll, I'll vote for him.
Do you think he's the best Republican for the job right now? I think he's the one the consensus can. I think Jim has done a tremendous job uh, coming out really from being a, a Freedom Caucus person to come out and do a tremendous job leading uh, one of the major committees in Congress and showing some facile ability to uh, gather consensus and to bring um, bring to light some of the massive injustices done by the Biden administration and some of the agencies. And so I, I think he's the best candidate we have in front of us. You made an interesting tweet last week that anyone who's ever gotten dental work done, you know, their eyes, <laughs> eyebrows kind of raised a bit because you compared this to a root canal and you said something to the effect of, I'm looking forward to my next root canal, these House GOP closed door meetings. Do you have any insight into those? What stories can you share that maybe make would make me rather get a root canal than be part of this? Well, you know, it's funny. I was... Uh, a little bit punch, uh, punchy at that point in time, but you know nobody wants a root canal, and I don't think this process does the nation any good, because the real issues with the nation right now are our calamity at the southern border that Biden has opened the border. We don't know how many individuals from Hamas have come in the country, Chinese nationals that are coming into the country to destroy the country. This is where the real fight is. It's not really within the Republican Party. Um, that's the fight. Inflation is the fight. The out of control spending done by the Biden administration leading us to this inflation crime in the streets our absolute disaster of policy that happened in afghanistan leading in my opinion to ukraine and some of the other things that we've seen around the world so while this is messy some of the fights within the republican party the real issues facing the country right now are those because happened because of the biden administration's absolute incompetency Let's talk about where we are right now. Israel is at war. There's a looming government shutdown. Many voters and Americans are scared about the state of the economy. And your colleague, a Republican, Troy Nels, said the House Republican conference is broken. When you hear this, the word broken, how do you fix it? Yeah, I mean, in right, in a lot of ways it is because we have some individuals who, um, need to understand this is a team sport and there's despite some differences of personalities and everything we have to understand who the uh, adversary is and that's the policies put forth by the democratic party why do you think that is taking some people in your party a while to come around to why is there so much infighting well i just you know the, the democrats do a very good job of hiding their infighting but i, I understand it very well occurs ours we tend to do sadly enough more in public um, you know, this is just where uh, democracy is, uh, Brittany. It's a very, very messy process, and we're now exposing it now with a 24-hour news cycle, social media, the horrible parts of our existence that expose every, every different uh, 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 difficulty and challenge in humanity. That's where we are right now. This speakership vote and um, really storyline has been the storyline of 2023, starting with Kevin McCarthy's historic 15 rounds to get the speaker and then moving onward. So what do you think this says about the future of the Republican Party? Well, I, I don't see it again. I, I think the party is having its challenges right now, but the real challenges that face the country, again, it, it's not a party, it's an idea, it's an ideology. Um, by the Democratic uh, leftist at this point in time from the Biden administration, which we thought he was going to be a centrist. We absolutely thought that's what he portrayed himself to be, but he's been anything but. That's the real issue. That's the real problem. That's really what's broken with the country. This is a process. This process will eventually get fixed, but it's not the policies that are destroying this country. This process will eventually get fixed, you're saying, but right now we've been two weeks without a speaker at a really critical time. So how does sure. Congress plan to um, help out Israel right now? How do we aid Israel without a speaker? Well, we, we have already stopped. We have already well prepared and, and well supplied Israel right now to fight the horrible, horrible uh, Hiras, uh, excuse me, Hamas terrorists. And so it's not critical right yesterday at this moment, this, this to do this yesterday, um, that we fight them. It will happen soon enough, and we do need to get united in the Republican Party to be able to help our ally. I do want to talk about um, Israel now. Hamas launched an attack on Israel via land, air, and sea, the deadliest they have seen in decades on October 7th. Since then, Israel has bombarded parts of Gaza, and there's an expected ground invasion to occur. So what do you make of the Biden administration's response over the past two weeks? 
Well, the Biden administration has done an absolute failure in emboldening Iran to assist its proxies. Let us just not forget, just a few weeks ago, Secretary Blinken led to the fact that uh, he was he was freeing up six billion dollars in assets to help the Iranians. Well, Israel wants 10 billion. I prefer we give that to the uh, Israelis. Now, yeah, and, and there's been this argument the uh, six billion was going to go for humanitarian aid. Let's be realistic. The Iranians have done everything possible to work around any type of restrictions that have happened on their government. They also we, we've allowed the Biden administration has allowed uh, the Iranian government to enrich uranium up to 60 percent. It was four percent during the Trump administration. It's 90 percent to have a nuclear bomb. It's absolute naivety um, to allow the Iranians who are who are self-avowed want to tear this country down to give them the power that the Biden administration is giving them. The real problem in this world is we need to support our allies, those who we carry on as a, as a democracy, as friends in democracy, and to support them, to help annihilate these people who don't believe that Israel, the state of Israel, has a right to exist. I do just want to point out the White House has said there's no evidence supporting any claim that that funding did go to Hamas. But um, I do want to talk about our relationship. Well, I, with I, I, you know, I, I'm not gonna, I won't interrupt you, Brittany. Um, there's no evidence, but there's no evidence uh, for the FBI in 2019 that Hunter Biden's laptop um, was was Hunter Biden's, that it was ru Russian disinformation. So I'm sorry if I if I have a hard, difficult time believing anything that the White House says. I do want to talk about some Wall Street Journal reporting on this. I'm sure you've seen it. They uh, reported that Iran is actually involved in helping plan the Hamas attack. So A, what do you think of that uh, reporting? And B, how is this going to change the United States' relationship with Iran? Because as you know, we haven't had a diplomatic relationship since the 80s. So what does that look like going forward? Well, it's interesting. The Wall Street Journal is saying what the Biden administration is saying isn't happening. I believe the Wall Street Journal in this case. Point blank, when it is so naive to believe that these countries that want to see the United States and Israel absolutely fail, um, it's, it's absolutely naive to think that a carrot is going to make relations better and make them play better in the sandbox. They only understand strength. We saw that with the last administration, it was strength. And the, Israel, the Iranians were not able to achieve much. Now that we have an absolute weak government with Biden administration that seeks to appease bullies in the world, they're emboldened. Look at what happened with Putin. He was absolutely emboldened to do what he did in Ukraine during the disaster, right after the disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. So it's called strength against these evil uh, regimes rather than weakness. Just to be clear, do you think it is the Biden administration's fault that Putin invaded Ukraine? I absolutely believe that when uh, the disastrous withdrawal uh, in Afghanistan against uh, Biden acted against his own generals to withdraw from the Bagram airfield and all these other things created an absolute vacuum um, in that part of the world where our allies were embarrassed with us and absolutely emboldened Putin to then move. You know, these plans were been on the shelves for years. He probably turned to his general, said, now's the time to move. So I absolutely correlate what happened in Ukraine with the debacle in Afghanistan. Yes, I do. What do you think is next here going forward? Because we are seeing violence of epic proportions and people are very concerned right now that there's going to be a full fledged war in the Middle East. One, do you sure. think that's going to happen? And two, how does the United States tamp down these tensions? Well, um, you know, I actually, I, I'm fearful of what's going to happen in the world today. When you appease bullies, when you try to satisfy them and play nice with them, they don't, that's not what they understand. They understand strength. It emboldens these individuals who want to wreak havoc and chaos along uh, in the world um, to do their terroristic deeds. So I'm very fearful of that. The only way we can act is decisively with power and with strength. And how does the United States act with power and strength? What, are, what should we look for as Americans? Well, we have to do everything in our power to block, Hamas, uh, block excuse me, Iran from supplying Hamas, from supplying Hezbollah to carry out their terrorist duties. This is, you know, it, it's not, uh, it doesn't take rocket science to understand that the Iranians are behind the terroristic activities of uh, Hamas and Hezbollah. It was an absolute catastrophic intelligence failure, both on the Israelis and the Americans, um, with how Hamas, um, excuse me, Hamas was able to carry out 
what it did. And so we have to step up our game tremendously. And if it takes military action to stop the, the terror against Israel, so be it. <clears throat> I believe it was a national security advisor eight days before the Hamas attack said something to the effect of there he hasn't seen the Middle East so quiet in two decades. Mm -hmm. What do you think of yep. comments like that coming a week after the deadliest attack on Israel in over 50 years? I think there should have heightened their security. They're heightened their suspicions. Absolutely. At that point in time, when you go radio silent in a, in a world in a time where there is not radio silence. You have to really, really raise your suspicions that something evil is going on. There are many uh, international threats right now. I've talked to many lawmakers, presidential contenders. We talk about China, Russia, now Hamas. When it comes to the United States, what is our biggest threat right now? Our, our biggest external threat really is China. China, hands down. China is flooding our American markets with the precursors to fentanyl, and they're come and, China, and Mexico is creating those, killing 100 and close to 110,000 Americans last year. Our largest ad enemy, and I'll call it an enemy right now, is the Chinese Communist Party. They've infiltrated. They've tried to manipulate our currency. They're trying to be on college campuses. They have their own police force sets up, set up. So China, without a doubt, is our greatest adversary at this moment in time. Congressman, I do want to ask you just one more time, going back to the speaker vote, when can viewers expect this to be resolved? How many rounds are we going to go here? Yeah, well, Brittany, I don't know. Um, I wish I had a, a crystal ball like we all want to have. Um, I want us to have a speaker sooner than later. It's time to actually get towards back to the business of fight and fighting the real problems that are facing this country, not amongst ourselves. Congressman Murphy, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome back anytime. I can imagine how busy you are right now. Thank you so much, Brittany. God bless you and have you and you have a good day.